that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 539th edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell, the Invisible Man. In the flesh, but not in the studio. That's right. I am in the studio, but I don't know where that would go. Not in the flesh? It doesn't make sense. Um, anyway, this is a show that is made up of uh, segments that uh, deal with news items uh, dealing with energy and climate change. And we start on the 31st of August, which is a week ago today. And we go from there to the 6th of, uh, of uh, September, which is yesterday. Because we don't report the news as it's happening, we report it after it happened. Okay, the sixth of the sixth of September. Yeah, it says the seventh of September. Right? Today is the seventh. That's today, right? And this is uh, material that came from my blog, geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. You can go to that blog and go to the dates, click on the calendar, look through the shows, find what we're referring to, and read the articles. Or you can go down below on the screen. Um, and get uh, a file that you can download or a, or a uh, website that you can click on where you can get live links in either case. So, you set to go, Tom? I'm set to go. The first one says, and I quote, Hope in Michigan, colon, one policy, big impact. Yeah, let me put up the uh, picture. Put up your picture. Yeah, that's right. Um, this is a picture of Marquette, Michigan, which doesn't have anything in particular to do with the article, except that it happens to be in Michigan. Reminds me very much of a, of a town that I lived in in Illinois when I was about four years old. Anyway, this is cl from Clean Technica. The Michigan legislature appears to be pushing a clean energy standard that requires 60% of utility electricity to be from renewables or nuclear energy by 2030. 2030 is not that far off, and 100%. Oh, well, say the next, next part of that sentence. Yeah, and 100% by 2035. Now, that's significant. I think it is, yes. This is more ambitious than what was first uh, proposed, and Governor Gretchen Whitmer said she will support that effort. So we have a, a different thing from Michigan here. And, uh, well, they, lead, they seem to be leading the way, and this is this is the direction things are moving. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, you've heard, you've heard me say on this show, and I'll say it again. Back in those days, you, you <laughs> people actually paid for fuel. Yeah, people used to pay for fuel. Isn't that amazing? Now we've got a picture coming up of a friend of yours, Tom. Oh, I know him. <laughs> Yeah, this is a monkey in a hot spring. And I am a pet psychic, so I can tell you exactly what this guy was thinking as he was <laughs> staring at the photographer. He was thinking, hey, well, man. Well, that spring, I'll tell you. Yeah. Hey, man, this spring is reserved for monkeys. Stay out. <laughs> okay. Well, the first sentence of this article is significant. Hot, dry rocks lie below the surface everywhere on the planet. Yeah, they do. Guess what, gang? They do. This is from the Japan Times. So what do you got for a title? The race is on to tap a source of clean energy beneath our feet. It sure is. Hot, dry rocks. And the rocks below this monkey, by the way, were dry. Uh, dry rocks lie below the surface everywhere on the planet. And by using advanced drilling techniques that have been developed by the oil and gas industry, how do you like that? Some experts th who to thunk? Who to thunk? Some experts think it's possible to tap that larger source of heat and create ge geothermal energy almost everywhere. The the rocks below that monkey, if you go down far enough, are dry, and then above that some water comes in and that water gets heated up and it comes up to the surface as hot water 
and uh, there it is. So we're, we're using some of that water, but we're just using it to take elements like lithium out of it. Yes, that's right. There are places where you can get lithium out of the water or other things. But we're not using the heat. That's right, but the monkey is. <laughs> <laughs> Should we go on, Tom? Can't dance. Can't dance, okay. Uh, let's see, what's the next picture? Oh, it's a flooding from Hurricane Idalia. I don't know if that's Idalia or Idalia or Idalia or what, but I'm just going to say Idalia. Uh, that's good enough. It's good enough. Well, Deadly tropical storm Idalia floods parts of the Carolinas after puddling Florida. Yeah. We just make this one up here in the up, up here in Vermont. Well, yeah, we are uh, from Idalia, but there's other ones coming. There's a there's a Hurricane Lee, which is probably about 1,500 miles off the U.S. coast, but it's... They're out there. They're coming. They're coming. And this guy is, you know, all of a sudden it was a, it was a uh, Category 1, and then all of a sudden it's a Category 2, and then all of a sudden it's a Category 3, and it could go all the way to Category 5 before it misses the United States altogether and goes out to sea. I don't know where it's going to go, and I think neither does anybody else, but it could hit the United States. Anyway, this is from CNN. Um, Idalia weakened to a tropical storm as it dumped heavy rain, unleashed strong winds, and knocked out power in parts of southern Georgia and the Carolinas. Just the hours. Way to the south of us. Yeah, way to the south of us. Just hours after pummeling Florida's west coast and inundating communities um, with uh, flood water. And. Um, you know, I mean, these things, when they're no longer hurricanes, they can still be dangerous. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Irene. Irene. It, it, it may not be a hurricane anymore, but they still have a lot of rain. Irene did, just devastated Vermont, but it wasn't a hurricane by the time that it happened. It hard, Irene. Yeah. So um, that's, that's what it can be. You know, all those... Buildings along the Whetstone, uh, all those buildings, several buildings along the Whetstone were, were damaged, and uh, there were a lot of buildings that were kind of rendered unusable by it. So anyway, so we are up to Friday, September 1st, and we have a picture of uh, emissions and, an, and a story from Clean Technica. Well, it's a fairly large power plate with three stacks. Yeah, it's a it's not not exactly tiny. Yeah. Scientists are asked if humans have broken the Earth's climate. Yeah, this is an important story, not because of anything new that it says, but because it kind of gives some perspectives and things, and is actually a little bit comforting. Uh, is 2023 the year humans finally broke the climate? Okay. That's a question, isn't it? it? It sure is. The Guardian, newspaper Guardian, recently asked 45 climate scientists. In general, they said, despite feeling events um, that have ta taken a, fr a frightening turn, sorry, I'm reading this so badly, the global heating seems to date uh, seen to date is entirely in line with three decades of scientific predictions. So what it's saying, we haven't broken the climate yet. Not yet, although we're not doing a good job with it. We have to do better. And I think, I think that's the important thing. We have to do better. Um, things are only going to get worse until we do a lot better. And well, I don't... It's the first time I ever saw that... Uh, that uh, series of words broke the climate. <laughs> hey, I got news for you. The climate's going to function. <coughs> Just not, it might not function the way we want it to. But you if, got it. If, if it, if it doesn't function the way we want it to, then I suppose we could say it's broken. Okay. Um, That's something to look forward to. Yes. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to go on to the next picture. Oh. Yeah, it's a nice picture of a VW bus. An old one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's been restored, and it's been converted. And this is from Clean Technica. It's electric, too. That's the way it was converted. Yep. Yeah. 
makes sense. I, I have, I've had several of these things, and they were a lot of fun. There, I had a VW Bug, and I got to tell you, it was, it was as much fun to drive that VW Bug as it was to drive my TR3. Well, the thing about this, this thing was you could sleep in it. Yeah, well, you couldn't do that in a VW Bug. No, but, but in the bus you could. I mean, this, I, had a, I had a bed. Yeah. I had a stove. Yeah. I had a sink. And I had an icebox. An icebox? <laughs> an icebox. Icebox, okay. <laughs> it wasn't a refrigerator, but, it, but you, you put ice in it and it kept things cold. Okay. So I could, I could, I could travel anywhere, you know. And, yeah. Uh, when I got tired, I'd go take a nap. Yeah, and when you got thirsty, you could pull over and drink something that you had in your ISA box. Yeah. Articles from Clean Technica. Meet Daisy, the split screen VW T1 camper transformation. Yeah, why do I keep following what Kit Lacey does at E-Dub? Well, the I in that sentence is not me, it is the author of this particular article. Because the honesty of his passion is shining through. There are plenty of very passionate builders out there, but Kit is so easygoing that it is soothing to follow his endeavors. Also, his electric conversions of old VW campers are epic. And by the way, if you go to this article and you, you take a look <coughs> excuse me, at the links that are in it, you can get a link to E-Dub, and the, the fellow who operates that does a lot more than just VW campers. He does conversions of all kinds of things. Uh -huh. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's really easy, interesting to see what's happening with these things. And I, I kind of wonder why the U.S. government doesn't put really big subsidies to, the, to conversions of older cars. Because if we want to deal with, with um, automotive emissions, one way to do it is just to say, okay, here is, a, here is a, an engine, and the VW Bug's engine is a perfect example of this. Every B VW Bug, as far as I know, had an engine that bolted in the same. And in fact, they were the same as the, um, as the uh, um, Porsches, the original Porsches. Yes, they were. And you could take an engine out of a Porsche and put it into just about any old VW bug you wanted to put it into and have a powerful engine. Same I put a Corvair engine in a VW. You put a Corvair engine in? Yep. Did, did, it, did, could, did it reach the moon when you stomped on the accelerator? It went fast. <laughs> I bet it did. That's a major conversion, though, isn't it? No, it, it, it was relatively simple. Really? You know, the Corvair engine was air-cooled. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. Okay, should we go on, Tom? Can't dance. Okay, I will put the next item up. And here we see a pair of hurricanes. One of them is Idalia again. This is, this is a relatively recent picture of the Atlantic Ocean. Yes, it is. And as a matter of fact, I'll just call your attention to a few things. About a th third of the way up the picture on the left side, you can see the coast of Louisiana. Yep. Um, about a third of the way to the, toward the right, at the, near the bottom, you can see the southern coast of Florida. Yep. And about so a third of the way from the left toward the right, at the top, you can see Lake Michigan. Yep. So here is Idalia and Hurricane Franklin, which never made any attempt to come in our direction, and an article from CNN. How Italia's final moments dramatically altered its impact on Florida and prevented a worse disaster. Yeah, this is its final moments as a hurricane, which meant we're talking about Idalia here as it's just hitting the coast of Florida and, and moving inland. Hurricane well, they say his final moments. That was his final moments as a hurricane. And that's it right. It went on and did all kinds of damage. But this particular article is really kind of fascinating to read. Hurricane Idalia caused significant dam damage as it ripped into Florida's Big Bend with 125 mile per hour winds and a record storm surge. 
But the storm's evolution before landfall and lucky timing with the tides very likely prevented a much worse disaster. So we got off the hook as a nation. The people in Florida got off the hook. That was a fluke, huh? That was very largely a fluke, that there weren't far, that the, uh, far worse uh, bits of damage going on there. Yeah. So we're up to Saturday, September 2nd, and we have an article from... Oh, those funny-looking things. Yeah, what are they? This article is from Wyoming Public Media, and those funny-looking things are wind turbines. And they Wyoming look, could reap more than $7 million if it takes full advantage of the IRA. But there are many challenges. Yeah. By the way, the IRA is the individual... Re, in, 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 I'm sorry, the Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. Right. Uh, actually, that was, th that was passed on a bipartisan basis. Yes. <laughs> All of Wyoming's representatives in Washington, D.C., voted against the Inflation Reduction Act. That was a, kind of foolish. Yeah, a recent analysis by Rocky Mountain Institute, actually it's called RMI now, shows that Wyoming could get more than $7 billion by making, it, making use of it. Here is an interview, and there are not all that many people in, in, uh, in Wyoming. This is like thousands of dollars per person. Um, and that would that would go into building those funny looking things that you see there. And by the way, those look like they're close together, but they're not. They're not right. No, if you can tell they're not. If you did an analysis, this is something that I actually know something about. Studied this in college. Um, in perspective, if you do an analysis of the perspective of that, you suddenly realize that those things. In order to be close together, they'd have to be really short, um, and and they aren't. They're really tall, and that means that they are very far apart. The yep. the blades of those wind turbines don't come anywhere near each other when they oh, turn. Actually. Yeah. Okay. Have we have we uh, done enough with that article, or do you have more to say? We have. Let's move on. We got an interesting picture here of the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah, the Golden Gate Bridge. And whoops, there we go. If you look on the left side of that picture, on the far shore, you can see the the buildings in San Francisco. Uh huh. Yeah. Look and see. Well, you can tell it's the Golden Gate Bridge by the squares, the, the squares in the towers. Yeah, Golden Gate Bridge is pretty distinctive looking. It's not quite as distinctive looking as the Brooklyn Bridge. But there's nothing like the Brooklyn Bridge aside from the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> yeah. And this one is from Clean Technica. It is storing float. California becomes the largest economy in the world to call for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Now, this is interesting. Isn't it interesting? In a historic move, a resolution calling for the state of California to endorse a call for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty passed in the state assembly, making California the largest economy in the world to support this proposal. And, you know, it, what they're trying to do is to get other countries, states and countries, cities, whatever, to, whatever. to uh, join this uh, this movement to basically, they, we have to get off fossil fuels. There's just no doubt about that. Bingo. Yeah, and they're they're trying a new promotion to do that. Yeah. Now we have a picture of California there. We also have a picture that shows cars going across the Golden Gate Bridge, and I I you know we've got to convert to electric vehicles, but I think just as much to the point, we have to. Start thinking about living a different kind of life, because we're living a life that kills people. Well, we're going to be forced to if we don't do it voluntarily. Yeah, that's true. I think that's true. We don't. We don't really have a choice. We can put it off. If we do, we'll suffer more. We're. We're. We've already put it off thirty or forty years too long. Yep. You know, I was thinking about this earlier. Um, Here's luck. What? Beginner's luck. Yeah. Um, when I, I, my first memory 
of, of talk about um, climate change was, I think, in 1957. No kidding. Yeah. And wow, that was... I was out of high school. Yeah, I was, I was not even into high school. And I had a teacher who lived in northern Minnesota when he was young. And he said that the old timers where he lived in Minnesota used to tell him about how the winters in the old days were colder and there was much more snow. And it was about two years after that that I found out that the glaciers in Gla the Glacier National Park were receding. And they were receding very slowly, but the majority of them were receding. This is like 1958 or 59. Well, they still are. As a matter of fact, they're going to have to rename the park. There aren't any glaciers. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit worse today. And the more you know, time passed, the more I found out that climate change was going on. This is not a new phenomenon. This is not something that was brought. And you know, the, the people who are um, climate change deniers will say that people who favor the idea that climate change is real are doing it for political reasons. And then they tell you that climate change was made up by socialists. <laughs> And I got news for you. There's no connection between climate change and socialism at all. I mean, any more than there is between no climate change and socialism. Socialism isn't going to benefit from people believing in climate change. No. I mean, how socialist is it? Is the idea that a person could put solar panels on his roof and a battery in his, in his garage and live independently, is that socialist? Doesn't sound like it to me. No, it doesn't sound like it to me either. But they try to make it that be what it is. So, I'm I, I don't know. There you go. Um, all right. I'm well, gonna, we're going to do it whether we do it voluntarily or if we're forced to. Yes, that's true. Okay, we have a an article here from WKMS, which is probably a new uh, a TV station, and a picture of. FEMA people working in Kentucky in a disaster in the winter. And I'll bet you have a title. Uh, I, I bet I do. Fossil, fool, foss, fossil fools. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Fossil fuels failed Kentucky utility customers during winter blackouts. Yeah. Now, that's yeah. interesting. How did that happen? Louisville um, Gas and Electric and Kentucky Utilities implemented rolling blackouts for many of more than 50,000 customers on the coldest day of the year last winter. That's not pleasant when that happens. They had blamed the forced outages on natural gas supply disruption, but tr uh, testimony reveals that coal power failed also. Wind power didn't fail. Solar power didn't fail. No, but fossil fuels failed. Fossil fuels failed. And people, I think, should understand this. The natural gas system fails for a number of reasons, one of them being, and this is one that happened in Texas, the valves got, you know, natural gas often has a small amount of water in it. And the water... Well, blackouts are kind of dangerous because if you get a blackout in the summer, you just get a little warmer. Yeah. But if you get a blackout in the winter, you could freeze. That's right. The problem is the natural gas has water vapor in it. The water vapor condenses in the valves. And then in really cold weather, it turns to ice, which means the valves can't be opened and, or, or altered. They can't change them. So you've got these you problems. You can't provide enough heat for yourself. What's that? You can't provide enough heat for yourself. That's right. And that can happen in the, in, the, in the power plants. In Texas last winter, there was a nuclear plant that shut down. Why? Because its cooling system failed in the cold weather. Yep. Now, cooling systems also fail in hot weather. And they fail in dry weather. And they fail in other circumstances. And, you know, you, anybody who thinks that a natural gas, coal, or nuclear plant is going to be reliable where, nu where um, renewable energy is not, is, uh, is n not well informed. 
So that's that. Moving right along. Moving right along. Here we go. We have a picture of a nuclear power plant. And we're up to Sunday, September 3rd, and the article is from DW, which I believe is Deutsche Welle, which means German wave. Does it, huh? I believe okay. so. Well, German Chancellor Schultz says the nuclear energy issue is a dead horse for Germany. Yeah. Now, I want you to, I want you to note... Um, in Germany, all of the nuclear power plants have been shut down. Okay? Yes. Quote, nuclear energy is over, end quote. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said, quote, the issue of nuclear energy in Germany is a dead horse. Anyone who wants to build a nuclear power plant would need 15 years and would have to spend 15 to 20 billion euros, which is... 16.2 to 21.6 billion dollars for each. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money and it's a lot of time and we don't have that much time that we can spend that much money and wait for an outcome 15 years away on nuclear power. And I got news for you. It's not just big nuclear power plants, it's little nuclear power plants too. They've been promising these small modular reactors for years and years. And yeah, they're going to come up with them. But before, well, Germany has already got, got off nuclear energy. Yes, that's right. Before small modular reactors can be installed in the numbers that are required to have an effect on climate change, they are going to have to ha be built. They are going to have to be tested just to ensure that the design actually operates safely, and that'll take at least a year. And then they're going to have to be... Um, built in a factory that gets built to make them. And that factory is going to have to be built. It's going to take time. And by the time we're done with all of that, it's going to be at least, I would guess, six to eight years before they can be turned out from a factory. And by that time, too many years have gone by. And coming out the other side, they're going to have to complete, compete with near-firm solar and near-firm wind which come to market with, an, uh, with a wholesale electric cost of three and a half to four cents per kilowatt hour and near firm. Whatever. And you don't have to pay for fuel. Yeah, and near firm means as good as nuclear in terms of reliability. So there you go. It's, I think nuclear is a dead issue. It's just that well, it is for Germany, but I think you're right. It's, 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 it's a dead issue for everybody. Yeah. Now, In the long run, it certainly is. Yeah. Okay. We have an article here from Microgrid Media. And the this picture is the uh, Scottish Highlands. That is the Isle of Skye, which is the largest of the Inner Hebrides. Uh -huh. And it is well known for its very picturesque uh, landscapes. And it's a big island. This is not an island that you can walk from one side to the other comfortably. Um, How the Scottish Highlands are becoming a renewable energy powerhouse. Yeah. Scotland's highlands and islands have long been known for its sparse population and less favored farmland. Yeah, they, it's hard to grow, hard to farm in, in the highlands. However, with renewable energy, the region has undergone a shift in fortunes to become a thriving hub of innovation and opportunity. So the Highlands are a good location for renewables, right? Like yeah, wind. absolutely. You can put up uh, wind power uh, plants and so forth. It reminds me a little bit, this story reminds me a little bit of a story I read a bunch of years ago that said that um, uh, Dutchy, what is the name of the company? Dutchy Organics, something like that. <coughs> it's um, uh, Prince Charles, King Charles when he was Prince, Prince of Wales, um, was also the, the Duke of Cornwall. 
And the Duchy of Cornwall is not the same as the County of Cornwall. The Duchy of Cornwall is probably three times as big, and it's spread all over Western England. And um, it's a little bit of land here and a little bit of land there. And it includes most of Cornwall, but it also includes, as I understand it, most of Devon. And Prince Charles decided that he wanted all of his tenant farmers to, to be organic farmers. And so they did. And the result of that was that they all of a sudden found that their uh, produce was being sold all over Europe. That's interesting. And the result of that was that they had a, a, entered into a period of prosperity like none they had ever had before. Now, Cornwall and Devon are not known as rich places. So, you know, but they, they benefited from that. Okay, should we move on, Tom? Yes, yes. We have a lovely picture that has been somewhat um, made unlovely by power lines. And an article, uh, we have the, the article comes from KJZZ. I don't know whether that's. Um, this sounds like a trade television station. Yeah, it does, or radio. And uh, what do you have for a title? Powered by wind, this $10 billion transmission line will carry more energy than the Hoover Dam. Right. As CEO of Pattern Energy, Hunter Armistead, said breaking ground on the new Sun Zia transmission line marks a major milestone. The U.S. needs to bolster its already swamped power grid as demand increases and weather events become more extreme. And you know, I, I'm going to put. This power line stretches 500 miles from central New Mexico to Arizona and California. So this is a significant transmission line. It's a significant transmission line, yes. The thing is, I wonder about these transmission lines because I honestly think we would be far better off in a number of different ways if the renewable energy were closer to the, to the uh, consumers who actually use it. I think one of our articles coming up says exactly that. Yeah, I think so. But, you know, it's, I'm, I'm reminded of a couple of things that I read in the past. One of them was about a battery that a company had, somebody had, had done, a, done a bids on a huge solar farm in Arabia. And the f f solar farm was a long ways from where the customers were going to be using the energy. And a, um, a battery was, was, um, was um, suggested for, to be put in at the solar farm. And I got in contact with somebody who understood this, and he said, you got to understand, if you have the solar farm running and it's going to transmit all of its out output to the city that it's supplying, that means that you need, I don't remember, a 300 megawatt line. But if you have a battery, it can just translate, transmit 120, 120 to 150 megawatts maximum m much more steadily. And that means that you have a very much less expensive uh, transmission line. You have f half or less than half of the copper being installed in a line that's 100 miles long or 150 miles long. And that pays for the battery. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, let's go on. We're up to Monday, September 4th, and we have a picture of wind turbines. Is that what that is? Huh? I think it is. You know, I might be wrong. Anyway, this is from Yahoo News. China makes a major strategic decision that will impact the whole world based upon, quote, our sense of responsibility. Yeah. The Good News Network reported that the government of China outlined its intentions to install 100 gigawatts of renewable energy, particularly solar and wind, in desert regions by 2026. In its now that's interesting. That's a that's a crazy amount of uh, amount of uh, of uh, capacity. And you know we have a our, in fact our next our next 
item. We'll, we'll actually discuss that. Uh, tell us what a gigawatt actually is. That, should we just jump to that, Tom? Why not? Okay. Get All right. The, here we have a picture. Coming right up, it's got a picture of a solar bunch of solar panels. It sure does. But it says, and I quote, how much power is a gigawatt? Yeah, don't you love it? Now, Tom, tell me how much power is a gigawatt. It's a gigawatt. Now, I want everybody out there to remember it's, Tom's response, okay? Because it's equivalent to a million horses. <laughs> Let me read it, Tom. This is from Clean Tech. Two million solar panels, <laughs> 300 wind turbines, or 2,000 sports cars. Okay. At the end of 2022, there were over 144 gigawatts of wind power and 110 gigawatts of solar PVs in the United States. To help put this number into perspective, it's important to know how big a gigawatt is. We might envision a gigawatt as 2.469 million solar PV panels. Got that? Just put that number in your mind. Visualize 2.469 million solar panels. Can you do that? I can't. Forget it. Anything above seven, it's hard to visualize. Uh, 310 utility wind turbines. Uh, again, that's more than seven. How about? That's what I have just, just finished saying. Yeah. Equivalent to a million horses. Yeah. Two million solar panels. That's right. 300 wind turbines. Yeah. 1.3 million. Yeah, 1.3 million horses. Can you envision 1.3 million horses? That seems like horses as far as the eye can see and then some. I, I just can't envision it. Or 2,000 2, Corvette Z06s. And I don't even know what, is two, what one Corvette Z06 looks like, so I can't envision 6,000 of them. Now, the question that I want to give to everybody is... Did that explanation do a better job, or did Tom's explanation, a gigawatt is a gigawatt? What well, do you basically, they're saying the same thing. I just rounded the numbers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, let's go on. We Moving have, right along, we got a picture of a rufous hummingbird. Yeah, that looks like a ruby-throated hummingbird to me, but in fact, as I think about it, it doesn't. Um, but they are, they are similar, no question about well, it. Well, the ruby-throated is more green. Yeah, with a, with a more red throat, to, uh, I would yeah. say, also. And ruby-throated hummingbirds, I don't know about those guys. I, They're beautiful. I, 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 I was sitting on my steps one day, and I heard this throbbing sound. And I looked over, and there was a female ruby-throated hummingbird getting nectar out of a flower that was about two feet from my head. They don't have the color, do they? No, they don't. But, man, they are brassy birds. They just, wherever they want to go, they go. They go. <laughs> and, you know, I was there. Yeah. Okay, this is from CNN. These tiny creatures are losing their battle to survive. Here's what we can do to save them. Right. Rufus hummingbirds are magical. The male's iridescent throat glows brighter than a shiny copper penny as it whizzes through the air, curiously hovering, ho hovering right in front of humans who ponder them. It has lost two-thirds of its population since 1970. Now, that's the synopsis, and what the article is saying basically is we need to give them a place to live, or we need to ensure that they have places to live. Habitat loss is a big deal. And we have to ensure a bunch of other things to make sure that these animals and other animals and plants that we value, monarch butterflies being one, um, we have to ensure that those animals and plants survive. And the only way we can do that is to take care of the environment. So, Well, whether we like it or not, we're all interdependent. We are interdependent, but, you know, just f for emotional purposes. There are reasons why we don't want to lose the things that we love. Yeah. And, you know, some people don't care, and I feel very sorry for them, to tell you the truth. Yep, I hear you. Okay, we're up to Tuesday, September 5th, and we've got an, a, 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 uh, an article from Energy Monitor. 
And nice picture of a solar array. Yeah. This is, um, I think this is actually the solar array. No, sorry. Go ahead. I heard clicks. Are you still there? I am still here, Tom, and you're still there, at least in... The global power sector saved $521 billion in 2022. The fuel savings from renewables. Now, you know, Tom, you talk about this all the time, about people saying someday, well, in the old, in the old days, they used to spend money on fuel. There you go. And now you've got an article that says, yeah, Tom's right, and here's how much. A report from the International Renewable Energy Agency shows that in 2022, renewable power deployed, deployed globally since 2000, save, uh, saved countries an estimated $521 billion in avoided fossil fuel costs in the electricity sector. And that is... That's significant. Yeah, you, you know, I forget, uh, was it Dirksen who said, Senator Dirksen who said a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. I think, I think it was Dirksen, yep. Yeah, he was, he was an interesting character. Yeah. Yep, okay. Now we are up to an article in, in uh, Clean Technica about air pollution. And yeah, there's... Nice. Nice picture of air pollution. Yeah, we've got a good picture of air pollution. Those cars are giving pollution of their own, but by golly, there's a mess in the sky. Okay. Air pollution and its threat to health are unequally spread throughout the world. Well, that's, that's not surprising. No, it's not. Air pollution, oh, let's see, as global pollution edged upward in 2021, so did its health burden. Data from the Air Quality Life Index shows. Um, if the world permanently reduced fine particulate uh, pollution to meet the WHO's guideline, WHO is the World Health Organization, life expectancies would increase by 2.3 years. So if you don't want to if you don't want to deal with pollution, if you think that it's grand to just burn oil, drive a car that pollutes, uh, let the factories and the and the um, power plants, you know, put out climate you know climate changing stuff and particulate matter is what they're actually talking about here. Well, if you think that's fine, just think about the fact that it's costing you. 2.3 years of your life on yeah, average. average. Yeah. But yeah, that's an average. That's not 2.3 years of your work life, by the way. It is 2.3 years of your retirement life. Uh huh. <laughs> because it's it's taken off the end, guys. So yeah, right. this is 2.3 years of doing what you want to do, hopefully. But you know, there it goes. So you want to go on a on a fishing expedition to Maine or the Adir or you know wherever. You want to go out on a on a on a tour on a on a big ship. You want to. You know what I always wanted to do, Tom? I wanted to to get a barge with with a uh, like a cottage built onto it so that I could use it as my home. And I wanted to, a barge. And I what? It's a houseboat. It's a houseboat, but this would be a barge, literally a barge, because I'd want it to be taken in a barge, in a group of barges, from where it would start to where it would end, and I would want to take it to from between the Door Peninsula, Green Bay, actually, Wisconsin, and in the in the summer, and take it down to New Orleans for the winter. I just thought it would be grand fun to do that. And I, th that was an idea that came up to me when I was about 13 and I read Life on the Mississippi. Okay, we gotta move on, I'm afraid. Uh, we yes, have man. another picture of solar panels. Is that what that is, huh? I think that's what it is. I notice there's no grass under them. Um, and that, I don't know if they really mowed down or if, 
I don't think that's because sheep have been grazing under them. And anyway, this is, oh, I know I why it is. Me, but it's awful, awful close, to, close to the ground. There's nothing growing there. I think there's nothing growing there. This is in Australia. This is from Renew Economy. Cheaper and quicker. Distributed networks put the case to host, put the, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Distributed networks put case to host wind and solar. Right. John Cleland, the head of Essential Energy, uh, which covers 95% of the land area of New South Wales, says that connecting new solar and wind farms into existing local networks. Now, the important word there is local will be, quote, several times, end quote, less expensive than connecting into transmission network. Now, this is what you and I were talking about just a couple of minute, minutes ago of having distributed energy connected locally rather than using transmission towers. Exactly. And that's what this is about. So, well, they're going to use it on a local level. Yeah, and it's cheaper. And by the way, it also means these are distributed networks, which means if the if the larger grid goes down, these guys have a good chance of being able to continue oh, to run. They keep going. Yeah, that's right. And you know, it it reminds me of a thing that goes up in India went up in India several years ago. They had a they had a, a bird called the greater the or the great Indian bustard, which is a big bird, but it's not a predator. And they put in a wind uh, uh, site, and all of a sudden, these big birds were, were dying, and they were threatened, so this was a big issue. The thing is, they were not being killed by the wind turbines. They were being killed by collisions with a transmission network. No kidding. Yeah. And wow. it, this would have happened anywhere that you put up uh, uh, wires. And... You know, the little birds, the sparrows and so forth, who get used to the uh, transmission lines in neighborhoods, that's not a problem. But these. Are you talking about something as big as a turkey? Yes, I'm talking about something as big as a turkey. And it was flying fairly high up, but, but not anywhere near high up enough to get into the wind turbines. But it, these birds were running into the transmission lines and killing themselves. And Which was, they really couldn't see. They couldn't see them because their eyes are in the sides of their head, and they don't, they don't do well with forward-looking vision. Okay, go on. Can't dance. We have a picture here of a, um, an offshore oil platform, and the article is from The <laughs> Scotsman. How about that? It looks like an oil, o offshore oil platform to me. Yeah, and that big thing that looks like a crane isn't a crane. What is it? It's the, it's the, the big um, apparatus they use for getting gas way up into the air where they can burn it. No kidding. Yeah. There is so a that, crane there. That's the source of the flares that you see. That's right. And they want to get those flares as far from the platform as they can. Yeah, I guess it makes sense to me. Yep. So what do well, you got? There's a hotel on, on, top, on the top of that platform. I'll bet there is. Anyway, what do you got for a title? What it says here, and I'm going to quote it, forget the Rosebank oil field. Labor's renewable energy plans could save 30 billion euros no. from the UK. You, you huh? read that wrong. 93 billion pounds. Huh? 93 billion, 93 billion pounds. pounds, that's correct, yeah. yes, for the UK household. Right, change is needed, but if the UK government approves the huge Rosebank oil field off the coast of Shetland and its potential to deliver 500 million barrels of oil, we can say goodbye to any serious hope of tackling climate, the climate emergency. That is from the... Uh, the um, the Scotsman. And well, unfortunately, because there's money to be made, it'll probably be developed. I don't know. You know, there was, um, let's see, there was a thing in the news today, and we'll be talking about it next week, I think, that said that a set of um, oil drilling sites in northeastern Alaska, um, the leases have been canceled. 
No kidding. The Trump administration had allowed the leases to be signed. Yeah. The oil industry had still not done anything to develop them. And honestly, I think it's because they don't feel like wasting money. But um, the, the Biden administration just canceled the leases. And I didn't see that the oil industry was squawking particularly loudly about that either. We'll just have to see how that, how that comes down. But they're, they're, uh, they're saying, no, this is, a, this is a refuge. It's delicate land. We should not be drilling oil on it. And, um, well, Shetland Islands are halfway between uh, between Scotland, Scotland, Scotland and Norway. Yeah. Yeah, Scotland and Norway. That's right. They're, They're out of nowhere. They are out in the middle of nowhere, and it seems to me that the people who live there are UK subjects, but they speak Norwegian. Is that so? I I I think that's what it was. I can believe that. Yeah, it was part of Norway for a long time. And then I think it was Margaret of Norway married the King of Scotland, and those islands were her dowry. Uh -huh. I think that's what it was. And then, of course, the King of Scotland became the King of England after Elizabeth died, so Elizabeth I. Anyway, we are up to, what are we up to? We're up to mischief. Oh, I see what we're up to. Okay, we are up to a solid-state battery. This is your your favorite battery, Tom. <laughs> well, you know, as as I've mentioned before, in four years we we spent exactly 40, 47 minutes discussing batteries. I thought it was forty-seven seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a that, that's not an accurate number. I mean, it's. I know that. But, you know, it's, you and I had the same experience. Now, I wasn't studying engineering, but I was always interested in energy. And I knew about car batteries, and I knew about uh, D cell batteries, and I knew about A, A and AAA and, you know, a few other things. But You do flashlight batteries, you do car batteries. Basically, and, yeah. oh, by the way, I think the pelt. The telephone companies used batteries, too. Yes, they did, and they used pretty special it. batteries. Okay, th this, is, um, this article is from Clean Technica. What do you got for a title? Aluminum materials show promising performance for safer, cheaper, more powerful batteries. Yeah, we have more and more ways to store energy in batteries than you can count. It's crazy there's so many ways. A team of researchers at Georgia Institute, Institute of Technology is using aluminum foil, I have some of that, to create batteries with high energy densities and greater stability. A report in Nature Communication shows that the batteries could hold more energy and be cheaper to make. And they're dry. Yeah. Now there's there's more to a there's more to a battery than just how much it costs and how much energy it can hold, but you know it's like some batteries deliver energy fast and some energy batteries deliver it slowly. There's things like that. Things like how well does it do when it's hot? How well does it do when it's cold? There's a lot to think about. But this is a big thing. There's probably more. Uh, development work done on batteries in the last 10 years than it was forever before that. I think you're probably right. Yeah. Okay, we are up to our last article, and we have a horrible picture um, of, a, of uh, this is actually, I think, East Harlem. Notice the railroad tracks in those, uh, probably. Well, actually, in East Harlem, they could be actual railroad tracks, not necessarily um, a, an elevated uh, urban train. This article is from. I think it is. I think it's an urban train. I think it it it's, uh, goes over its, into uh, northern Brooklyn. Okay. Um, Almost. I think it winds up in Astoria. Oh, okay. Okay. This is from Clean Technica. What do you got for a ti for a title? U.S. Department of Transportation finally suspends liquid natural gas by railroad. Okay. Rural. U.S. Department of Transportation suspended a rule arising from the Trump epoch that allowed the transportation of liquefied natural gas by rail across the country without any special permit. That's kind of ridiculous. Think, it's, like, it, it's like saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to put people who are going to be target shooting on the trains. <laughs> Just, <laughs> 
This is well, a they actually had an accident, didn't they? Yeah. This is a huge victory for the, plan for the planet and also for those li living in potential blast zones of these railroad trains. And by the way, I want to explain, that picture was not the result of a liquefied natural gas explosion. That was just ordinary natural gas. This was gaseous natural gas. I remember when that happened. In fact, we talked about it at the time. Um, a, an elevator in a building uh, in East in East Harlem had a, a natural gas leak into it. This is just ordinary gas coming from the city pipes. And the result of that was that the entire elevator space got filled with natural gas, mixed with air. Bad thing to do. And of course, some of it leaked into the next building over and into apartments and so forth. And the uh, somebody smelled the, the um, ethyl mercaptan they put into natural gas to make it very, very stinky. Um, they put tiny amounts in, but you can smell it. When you smell natural gas, that's what you're smelling, not, your, not the methane. Yeah, it's put in there so you do smell it. That's exactly right. And somebody smelled it and notified the city, and they had engineers on the way to shut the gas off and take care of the situation, but they, about 15 minutes before they got there, the building blew up. And there, this kind of thing happens with natural gas periodically. And by periodically, I mean every couple of months, something like this happens. They had a problem in, in New Hampshire, deadly problem. A bunch of houses burned down. A lot of things went wrong because a, an equipment malfunction on a gas line caused the pressure to spike. So you had foot-tall pilot lights and, you know, just bad stuff going on and a lot of buildings had buildups of natural gas inside them and they exploded and this is one of the problems with fossil fuels it really is so and and gasoline is just as bad you don't want gasoline you, one of the things that you do not want in your in your garage is gasoline which you probably have in your garage <laughs> if you've got a car or a lawnmower or a or a gas power generator, you probably have it. And I don't think that stuff is safe at all. Uh, one of the things the National Rifle Association pointed out many, many years ago was that it is safer to store gunpowder than it is to store gasoline. And you, yeah, and you store gasoline if you have a car. So sure. would you rather have a car or would you rather have a, a canister of gunpowder. Okay, I'm going to go up to the last slide, which says, have a cheeringly lovely week. You think you can accomplish that, Tom? I think so. Okay, I'm going to wave goodbye. Tom is, I know, waving goodbye. Tom, is your cat waving goodbye? Uh, he just left. <laughs> He doesn't he was lying here behind me, and I guess he figured out he was going to have to wait, so he got the heck out of here. I see. That's what you call a truly lazy cat. <laughs> okay. So, well, cats, cats are all pretty lazy, I'll tell you. Yes, they like to sleep, don't they? That's for sure. So I'm going to ask Tom to say that you should all come back. You all come back and see us, are you here? Keep that in mind.